take them up and we might be able to address some of them at the end of this webinar. Uh, at this point, I'd like to invite um, our uh, speaker, our third speaker for today, and that is none other than Hujatul Islam, Dr. Sheikh Mohammed Ali Shamali, uh, a graduate of the Islamic seminaries. He has a bachelor's and master's in Western philosophy from the University of Tehran and a doctorate in philosophy from the University of Manchester. He is the founding director of the Risalat International Institute, which is devoted to Islamic curriculum development and educational training, among other initiatives. And he has led numerous Islamic educational courses and seminars in over 30 cities across four continents. Of course, a very familiar figure uh, for our community, and we are so blessed to have him with us. He is also the, uh, the editor-in-chief of two journals and has been very active in interreligious dialogue for the last two decades. Welcome, Dr. Shamali, and we're looking forward to being enlightened by you. Thank you very much. <coughs> Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. In the name of God. Uh, please unmute yourself. Thank you very much. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. In the name of God, the compassion of the merciful. I am very grateful to God for giving me this blessing to be with you and share our understanding of fasting from our uh, traditions. I am delighted to uh, also make a new friend uh, from India and also to confirm uh, that uh, I met Bishop Malkas many years ago in Georgia. So when I saw him in Arbain procession video, so I thought I must have met uh, him and just today I managed to confirm that around 2000, maybe five. Uh, we visited him uh, in Tbilis and since then I remember him as a man of dialogue and open-mindedness so I'm very grateful and thank you sister uh, Dr. Machabin. Uh, it's very difficult I'm sure uh, my colleagues also had the same uh, experience it's very difficult to do justice uh, to this uh, important topic of fasting which is very much central in our faith and uh, um, I have to be very, very brief and very, very selective. So uh, I first admit that I cannot, you know, give you a comprehensive view about Islamic understanding of fasting. Uh, fasting is one of those things that is rooted in the Quran itself. It's not just something that we learn from the uh, traditions and or narrations. It's uh, mentioned in the Quran in several places and in a very special way that is not very common in the Quran. God says, Ya ayyuhalladheena amanu kutiba alaykum usiyam kama kutiba ala alladheena min qablikum la'allakum tattaqoon. You don't find this for many things. Uh, there are few things that God says it's written down as an obligation or as an instruction. And one of them is this, that God says, O oh, those who believe, it has been written down, it means it's a, a final and decisive command and instruction of God for you to fast and you are not the first. This has been also the case with uh, those who were be before you, believers before you. And the reason is so that you may become pious, so that you may become God-fearing people. So we realize that fasting has been always part of uh, faith tr uh, traditions. We are not the first as Muslims. And also we realize that this is obligatory, means something without which we cannot reach our felicity, our aims in our life here and the hereafter. And also it's a requirement for piety, although God is telling us there is no guarantee. It's not that everyone who fasts is going to get definitely the piety. But if it is done with understanding, with commitment, and with bringing all the requirements, then it has the potential of taking you there. We have different types of fasting. We have 
obligatory fasting, we have recommended fasting. Actually, in our jurisprudence, apart from two days in the year, throughout the year, you know, we can do recommended fasting. And it's just two days that we must not fast. And then we have also days which are more recommended, so the reward goes uh, higher. But there are also obligatory fasting, but the main one is the fasting during the months of Ramadan. Sometimes people miss maybe uh, fasting the months of Ramadan in certain cases. Then they have to uh, catch up with their fasting later. Or sometimes as a c compensation, there is a kafara of fasting. Sometimes when people make a vow, fasting becomes obligatory. But the main obligatory fasting is the fasting in the months of Ramadan. So I want to have a little reflection on the benefits of fasting and on different also levels of fasting if time permits. Otherwise, I leave the second for question and answer time. So the benefits of fasting are many. And these are the things that are all mentioned in our uh, text and the scriptures and are very well known to uh, all uh, you know, Muslim uh, scholars and public. First of all, we should know that fasting is not something which is separate from a more general instruction in Islam, which is how to manage your lifestyle in this world. Islamically, we need health of body and health of soul. Well-being of body and well-being of soul both are needed and both are also connected. And part of well-being of body is to eat proper food, to drink proper drink, to have good rest, but not in excess. Anything which goes in excess then turns out to be actually harmful. And not only harmful for our body, but also harmful for our soul. Therefore, we have many, many hadiths about the need for being very careful about not only what we eat, but also about how much we eat. Even if the best food, the healthiest food, if we eat too much, it's not good for our body, neither it is good, nor it's good for our soul. For example, I just mentioned one uh, uh, hadith from the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. He said, "Thalathatun yuhibbuha Allah." There are three things that God loves, among other things, of course. "Qillatul kalam wa qillatul manam wa qillatul taam." To reduce your a speech, a speech a speaking too much is very harmful. To reduce your uh, sleeping. If you uh, sleep too much, you are wasting your time, but also it would affect your health and your uh, mentality, your understanding, etc. And to reduce your food. So reduction of uh, speech, reduction of uh, sleep, reduction of food to the balanced amount is a very important part of Islamic lifestyle and well-being of the body and well-being of the soul. So this is something to remember that even when we are not fasting, somehow we are in a general way fasting because, or we are supposed to fast. There are many things that we don't eat and also certain amount we should not eat. There are many things about this. And in a particular way, when it comes to the relation between hunger and understanding or hunger and wisdom, this is a great part of Islamic spirituality. You cannot find any spiritual master uh, in Islamic tradition unless would say 
that we need to experience hunger in a controlled way, in a, uh, of course, supervised way. And this is very important for gaining wisdom. Even in Hadith and Mi'raj, when the Prophet had ascension to heaven, uh, to sky, this was also part of the discussion between God and the Prophet about hunger. And when the Prophet said, what is the legacy and what's the outcome of fasting? God told him wisdom. Or what is the legacy of hunger? God said wisdom. And I just mentioned one hadith here. The Prophet said, لا تشبعوا فيطفع نور المعرفة من قلوبكم Don't feel your stomach because if you do so, the light of understanding, the light of knowledge will disappear in your heart. So, this is a general thing to observe. So, we have a foundation of being very careful about our eating and drinking and lean more towards reduction than, you know, sleeping or speaking or eating or drinking too much. Now, when it comes to fasting, then it becomes very disciplined. It's very disciplined. There's certain time from where when we start to fast and certain time where we end. So from down to sunset, we should not eat, we should not drink, we should not have a marital relation. There are certain things that we have to avoid. And then this is for whole month. This is the longest period of worship in Islam. Because, for example, we have Hajj, pilgrimage to Mecca, but it doesn't take one month. And daily prayers, they don't take that long. This is the longest duration of worship. And everything is very clearly defined, you know, uh, rulings, you know, for travelers, etc. So it's very organized, very disciplined. For people who have not experienced it, I'm sure it looks very difficult. And I think they feel, you know, pity for Muslims, you know, that they, are, they have to suffer. You know, sometimes I have seen some of my, you know, non-Muslim, for example, friends uh, who are not, you know, religious. Sometimes they think, you know, we suffer a lot and they feel very sad for us as if, you know, we are going through unnecessary suffering. But those who have experienced it, even non-Muslims who have experienced, you know, during the months of Ramadan or those who have in their own tradition, they know actually we are not suffering, we are enjoying Yes, we are stretching, we are stretching ourselves, but it gives us a sense of satisfaction, a sense of achievement. And you feel, if I am able not to eat and you know, drink for one month, then what challenge is there that I cannot, as a human being, undertake? So it's a great you know, uh, sense of achievement, especially in this day and age that I think one of our greatest problem is that we are becoming too weak, too dependent, too used to everything, technology, everything, f uh, food, drink, juice, everything, cakes, etc., coffee. <laughs> we need a time of having some kind of, you know, uh, sabbatical, a kind of a spiritual, you know, sabbatical so that we see God has created us in the way that we don't need to rely too much on these things. And we don't need to harm ourselves by enjoying too much and by indulging ourselves. So this is a very important aspect of fasting. But also it helps us with many other things. For example, it helps us with understanding better what happens to the people who are poor. For example, our 11th Imam, Imam Askari, said that by fasting, someone who is rich should find the pain of hunger. Because even people who are hungry around you, if you have not experienced this, you don't understand them. If you have not experienced any kind of suffering, just by seeing people who suffer, you cannot understand the depths of it. So, 
you see in Muslim world the amount of charity that they do in the months of Ramadan goes very high partly not I'm saying it's the only reason partly is because of their spiritual there is a commendation but I think partly is because we all understand better that what does it mean to be hungry what does it mean to be thirsty what does it mean to not have basic needs of your life we become softer there is less arrogance there is less negative pride when you are fasting also it is good to remember the day of judgment and when we have to also experience hardship our prophet said about uh, months of ramadan and the fasting that when you become hungry when you become thirsty in the months of ramadan remember hunger and thirst on the day of judgment you have to prepare yourself for that time you have to take your provision for that time so it makes us think about something beyond this world as long as I am busy with enjoying myself and you know preparing food and eating and drinking and washing and all these things you know cleaning and you know I may think life is just this <laughs> sometimes we need to go through different pattern of life to realize that we have actually a greater life waiting for us and also it's very good for uh, our uh, ability to resist against temptations and this is also a very important part of you know spirituality that through fasting you are able to resist against temptation better control your appetite better etc but is fasting just a matter of not eating and drinking or there is something more if fasting was just not eat and not drink then every year you know millions or you know i don't know hundreds of millions of people are fasting but is all are all of them achieving the purpose are all of them achieving that taqwa that god fearing god says god knows it seems not everyone who is fasting is getting there because it's much more than just not eating it starts with that but doesn't end with that uh, Lady Fatima, daughter of the Prophet, said that if you fast but you don't protect your tongue, you don't protect your ear, you don't protect your eyes, you don't protect your organs, then what type of fasting is this? You think you are fasting, but if I am the same person, when it comes to dealing with my you know, clients, customers in the shop, or office or colleagues in the work or my neighbors or my if I am the same person as I used to be in the before so what impact does or sometimes God forbids in the months of Ramadan some of us become more angry <laughs> and you know less <laughs> patient we become impatient sometimes and sometimes maybe we allow ourselves no you have to learn in this month how to control everything whether it's your eyes your ears your tongue your hand your feet your stomach everything must observe fasting it, it starts with eating and drinking but it doesn't end there so muslim mystics say based on these uh, traditions that we have that we have three levels of fasting at least if you want to put a, a subcategories together so we can say three general categories one is to observe legal or jurisprudential requirements which we learn in practical manuals that we have which lists things that you have to avoid and uh, if you do this your fasting is legally valid second is to avoid any sin not to commit any sin when you are fasting even if it's not making your fasting legally invalid 
like lying for example lying general lying certain types of lying for example if you lie and attribute something to god of course this invalidates our fasting but if something is general we must avoid because any sin affects our fasting any injustice breaks our fasting from a spirit in the spirit it's affecting our fasting so this is second level not to commit any sin but the third level is to fast with respect to anything other than God to make anything other than God forbidden for yourself nothing is worth enough to be our aim in our life our purpose in our life only God so those who are fasting indeed they must try to detach themselves from anything not just food from anything other than God anything worldly has to be kept yes anything which is godly like charity work helping people this is good because this is for the sake of God but anything which is selfish anything which is mischief anything which is you know destructive harmful anything which just a matter of gaining for the sake of consumption we have to refrain so that we experience the depths of fasting and I think I stop here if we have time during question and answer we can maybe refer to uh, some uh, other uh, topics about fasting but again as I said at the beginning I'm very grateful to share this platform with our dear uh, believers uh, co-believers in God from different traditions and I am very happy that we all have among many other commonalities our appreciation of fasting and I think although we see fasting is less prominent today in uh, different traditions but we need actually today more than ever to observe fasting we need more than people 14 years uh, centuries ago 20 centuries ago to observe fasting because this is something that in this busy life can keep us to the roots and to our nature thank you very much uh, thank you dr shamali and thank to you. all our uh, esteemed panelists for sharing their wisdom